introduce Philippa Mapes, um, who finished her PhD at Leicester in 2016. Um, she came to it, it was a collaborative doctoral award, uh, collaborative doctoral award, and she came to it from um, a previous history working with English Heritage, and she's back part-time working with English Heritage and as an independent researcher now. So, business of wallpaper, the English wallpaper trade, 1750 to 1830. Penny is seamlessly turning down the lights. <laughs> so, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Over That's to you, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yep, lovely. Thank you. Thank Thanks very much. Well, afternoon, everybody. Afternoon slash evening. Today I'm going to present some of my research findings which form part of my thesis on the English wallpaper <laughs> in the long 18th century. Can you just... Because <laughs> I've got a lot to get through. Ta-da! Okay. I'm going to carry on talking. Um, just to give you a bit of brief background about myself and how I came to undertake this study, um, I came initially from a museum environment, and after training at the V&A, I spent several years running my own business specialising in the conservation of historic wallpapers. What became evident, and indeed frustrating at the time, was the lack of understanding we had in our historic properties and museum collections of what we were looking at when we were faced with historic wallpapers. What was their social, economic and cultural significance? Could they be dated reliably? What was their status within the wider environment? One of my aims in undertaking my PhD at Leicester was to provide a fuller understanding of the material culture of the period through a case study of wallpaper and to provide historical context to the wallpapers in our museum collections and historic buildings in order to inform how these objects were used, by whom and where. In this I was supported by a grant from the AHRC and English Heritage for which I'm extremely grateful. Okay, so let's start. Previous histories of wallpaper from this period have chosen to focus specifically on art historical themes in the design of wallpapers and or its consumption by the elite and gentry classes. It's a typical example of a large-scale printed wallpaper from the mid-18th century, um, which would have been bought by uh, members of the gentry and the elite. Much of this has stemmed from the fact that our national collections of wallpaper from this period are looked after in museums of art and design, where collecting policies in the past have concentrated on recording examples of best design and execution. Furthermore, the relatively better preserved examples of this ephemeral object are, of, are more often found in our grander houses, and this, and the proliferation of country house archives, has led us to focus more in this area when looking at the consumption of wallpaper during this period. In this respect, wallpaper has much in common with other studies of commercial and material culture, which also tend to have an elitist bias due to the greater survival of personal archives of the wealthy and the greater survival rate of higher status, better quality or heirloom pieces. Although wallpaper his historiographies acknowledge that its use within the home spread to the middle classes during the long 18th century, it was previously not known to what extent, how, why and in what way this happened. The lack of sources of recorded and provenanced examples of wallpaper from middling class homes from this era led me to approach the subject from the supply rather than the demand side by looking at the businesses involved in the trade and how they were structured and run and who their intended customers were. Business histories have helped, have helped to inform studies of consumption by shedding light on essentially how things were being made available. Helped, most notably in the case of the pottery and calico trades, by the survival of, of richly detailed archives such as that of Josiah Wedgwood and the Peel family, calico printers of Lancashire. Unfortunately, for the wallpaper trade, no such archive has come to light, so it was necessary to gather information across a wide variety of sources, including probate and insurance records, newspaper advertisements, government archives, and bankruptcy records to explore business strategies and market marketing policies, and to put these together with extant examples of wallpaper from the period to establish what would have been available and to whom. My research covers the period 1750 to 1830, 
the wallpaper trade enjoyed massive growth during this period, as you can see from the graph there. The mid 18th century's good starting point from which to explore this growth, as by the as by this point, the use of hand-block printed wallpapers had been established in the homes of a relatively small wealthy elite and represented a novel and fashionable, yet still expensive alternative to textile hangings. An itemised invoice of the wallpapers purchased by Lord Lee for Stonely Abbey, for example, in 1763, reads like a shopping list of the most fashionable wallpaper styles at the time, including several flock papers, floral papers and chinoiserie designs, amounting to a total spend of over £356, which is roughly equating to about £30,000 today. The period under study ends in 1830, as from this decade, the trade moved from what was essentially a handcraft tradition to becoming fully mechanised, and thereafter, during the 19th century, wallpapers became affordable to all but the very poorest of, cust of consumers. The development of the market, from serving a small elite to the larger consumer group of the middling classes, was therefore a key factor in this growth. It's necessary, therefore, to situate wallpaper history within the wider context of economic and social history, and specifically the consumer revolution of the long 18th century, in order to understand more fully the impact these goods had on people's lives. This consumer revolution ran in tandem with the Industrial Revolution and was stimulated by the demands of the growing number of new middle classes. All manner of new consumer products from china, cutlery, ornaments, furniture and printed fabrics were developed, modified and appeared in the shop windows across Britain during this period, designed to seduce customers and generate new wants. Wallpaper was one of these fashionable luxury goods intended for display in the homes of any who could afford to buy into this lifestyle. I'm just going to outline briefly here the main factors um, driving the demand for wallpaper at this time in order to set the scene for how the trade, trade responded to, the, to that. So from the consumer's point of view, possession of such newly available and affordable consumer goods not only indicated status and fashion consciousness, but also expressed taste and discernment on behalf of the owner. Wallpaper was a necessary adjunct to the portrayal of a genteel lifestyle a backdrop to the fashionable interiors of the middling classes and upward. Here we see a satirical print from the 1790s with the caption, Captain Jessamy learning the proper discipline of the couch, showing an interior with all the typical um, furnishings of polite society, fashionable furnishings, win uh, window dressings, patterned carpet and, of course, wallpaper, but with the slightly lascivious occupant showing none of the accompanying genteel manners. These luxury and semi-luxury goods also acted as an aid to interaction across social groups, implying that those who possessed such goods had a shared understanding and appreciation of their cultural as well as monetary value. Rooms that were both social and private spaces within the home, such as the drawing room and parlour, were also decorated to reflect status, but in a lighter, more comfortable and informal way that was also suggestive of hospitality and domesticity. These rooms were decorated and equipped with the necessary tools of polite sociability, and here the new fashionable hot drinks of tea, coffee and chocolate would be offered. The ritual of visiting and taking tea allowed for the display of genteel manners, respectability, social status and ownership, and this was conveyed through the fashionable accessories of the tea table including porcelain or china cups and saucers, and silver or ceramic teapots. Wallpaper was, of course, seen as a fitting backdrop to these sociable activities, as is also evident in, this wallpaper, in these wallpaper fragments from a townhouse in Dis in Norfolk, where the wallpaper designer has taken the concept a little too literally with its teacup design in spelling out the association between the decoration and its implied intent. As a requisite to polite living, wallpapers were therefore also deemed appropriate decoration for use in shared public spaces outside of the home, including theatres, town halls, offices, shops, and most prolifically, in inns and pubs. 
So the one on the left is from um, the Ostrich Inn in Castle Acre near Swatham, um, and the one on the right uh, doesn't have a provenance, um, but obviously is hops themed to, uh, to hang in a pub. The second factor that must be acknowledged and, and is obviously a, a, a cheaper design than that one which is multicoloured and much more detailed. The second factor that must be acknowledged as a main driver to demand for wallpaper was the unprecedented level of house building that took place in the, early 18, in the 18th and early 19th century. So, Fueled by population rise and industrial and commercial development, high levels of urbanisation took place, not only in London and existing towns such as York and Newcastle, but also in newly established regional centres such as Liverpool and Manchester. Wallpaper offered a fashionable but also expedient wall decoration for speculative builders at this time, as it was more quickly and easily put up than carved wainscoting and it was to the new mid urban middle classes that wallpaper had its largest appeal. Advertisements for houses for sale highlighted the presence of paper hangings inside as they were automatically viewed as indicators of genteel lifestyle alongside other features such as new sash windows and the provision of separate rooms for eating, entertaining and for servants. One such advertisement in the Leeds Mercury in 1818 emphasised the respectability of the property by remarking that most of the apartments are hung with paper hangings, whilst also mentioning that the situation is only a thousand yards from the parish church and commands a most pleasing prospect and is a most desirable country residence for a small genteel family. Yet the demand for wallpaper at this time raises a number of questions. Whilst we know that wallpaper was cheaper than other wall treatments, such as textile hangings or wooden panelling, for both builders and consumers, it was still more expensive than plain painted decor. Yet why did it become so popular? Furthermore, there are some key differences between wallpaper and other luxury consumer goods enjoyed by a middling class market that must also be considered. Wallpaper was a one-off purchase so unlike a treasured investment piece of furniture or silverware, for example, it was, in the main, not portable, nor was it bequeathable. Once it was bought, it often incurred further costs in labour and materials to hang it, not to mention the disruption of having workmen in. Also, unlike a chair, a teapot or a mirror, for example, it could not be used. In this respect, its purely decorative qualities marked it out as a genuine luxury good. In addition to all this, the government tax on wallpaper during this period would also seemingly put a block on the expansion of the trade to consumers further down the social scale. Plain paper was a taxable commodity during the long 18th century, but wallpaper manufacturers were also legally bound to pay a further value-added tax on decorating the paper, which averaged out as one and three quarter pence per yard over the period in question. The tax was payable upfront by the manufacturers and the wallpapers stamped on the reverse to indicate this requiring, for large concerns, often daily visits by excise officers to stamp and record the manufacturer's output. These costs, of course, were then passed on to the consumer. And this restriction on the market meant that manufacturers could not sell wallpaper below a certain price without incurring losses themselves. So how could these factors influencing middle-class demand for wallpapers be reconciled with its supply? One of, the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the ways of exploring this is to look at how the wallpaper trade was structured and organised at this time. In common with many trades that became mechanised during the Industrial Revolution, successful large-scale enterprises have chosen to re retrospectively mythologise about their humble beginnings and see the large-scale factory system that emerged in the 19th century as germinating from an 18th century trade structure of small-scale individual artisan production. The wallpaper trade also described its own narrative in this period as one, by, as, as one run by artisan craftsmen, making hand-block printed wallpapers 
and with a more organised capitalist system only emerging much later in the 19th century. What in fact was in place in the wallpaper trade from the mid-18th century onwards was an industry firmly based in London and run by successful capitalistic businessmen, several of whom were from gentry backgrounds and were entrepreneurs with money to invest in this potentially lucrative trade. So you may be familiar with this trade card, 1760s Richard Macefield, um, his prestigious wallpaper shop in the Strand. Um, uh, depicting the fashionable wealthy customers enjoying the lavish interior of his well-stocked shop. Macefield, like several other wallpaper manufacturers at this time, came from a well-established family, many with connections to family estates elsewhere. <clears throat> the partnership was a common business model in this period as a way to pool resources and spread financial risk. And in the wallpaper trade, Partnerships were formed more often to bring capital, business expertise or marketing skills to the firm, rather than manual block printing skills. In the wallpaper trade, a sophisticated network of contacts existed, friends, relatives and business associates who were, who were often also wholesale suppliers in allied trades. Many were successful wholesale stationers, some with financial interests in the paper mills themselves, who invested in this additional sideline trade. Others had joint interests in paint manufacture and cognate trades such as calico printing and floor cloth manufacture, manufacture both of which use the same block printing process. In addition, in the increasingly dynamic economic climate of the second half of the 18th century, an ethos of risk-taking and speculation had developed. Business collapse and bankruptcy were frequent features of this volatile commercial environment, and many wallpaper businesses went bust. Not only did manufacturers require sufficient capital to pay the excise tax up front before sales, but they were also obliged to, set, to extend long periods of credit to customers, often amounting to a year. Thomas Bromwich, uh, wallpaper manufacturer uh, of Ludgate Hill, for example, waited two years to be paid by one of his wealthy customers. Uh, that was the bill we talked about earlier, £30,000. Um, so sufficient income was required to tide these businesses over between payments. Yet one man's financial fortune is another man's gain, and those who did not become bankrupt were able to benefit from the bad luck of others and, and takeovers, mergers and bankruptcy sales were all ways in which more affluent companies could grow and increase their stock of pattern designs and, crucially, the carved wooden printing blocks, as well as other equipment, at a much lower rate. In the workshops themselves, wallpaper production, or paper staining as it was termed, was carried out by a handful of skilled and experienced London journeymen and craftsmen. The owners themselves, often with no direct practical paper staining experience but with appropriate business skills, were thus able to concentrate on the anticipation of fashions and the observation of market trends, whilst the manufactory itself was increasingly run by foremen on their behalf. The production of prestige ranges of wallpaper were then reserved for more skilled paper stainers who would translate the latest patterns into the carved printing blocks. They would also print the more complex and expensive patterns, but the cheaper, more simple prints were printed by semi and unskilled labourers and children who were paid at a much lower rate. Once the more difficult element of interpreting a wallpaper pattern into a carved wooden printing block or blocks had been achieved, the more simple printing, plus other tasks, such as paint mixing and paper preparation, could be carried out by less skilled workers. Wallpaper production lent itself easily to this type of division of labour and made it possible to increase efficiency and save on labour costs. Wallpaper production in general required sufficient space to print the lengths of paper and also to hang them up to dry between the printing of each colour. 
Here we can see the division of labour in operation on a very small scale, obviously, um, ancillary work rolling up the uh, finished and dried uh, lengths of wallpaper. Somebody's preparing colour at the back there, and the block printer himself, the one with the skill, is, is printing the more complex designs. You can see the, um, the size of the building and the light required to, to carry out the work. So in order to increase output, larger premises were required. This necessitated a move out of the cramped city of London, where the trade had been based mid-century, to the peripheries of, peripheries of London, to larger and cheaper premises in the East End, north to Finsbury, south of the river to Southwark, and west of Westminster to the low-lying marshland of as yet undeveloped Chelsea. Here wallpaper manufacturers joined other trades in setting up workshops in large but now unfashionable 16th and 17th century mansions in the area vacated by their aristocratic owners in favour of more modern houses in town. Uh, this is Whiteland's house in Chelsea, um, which was a wallpaper manufactory. You can see here how useful these sorts of buildings would be with their sort of uh, long galleries, high ceilinged rooms, um, ancillary spaces in, in different wings to carry out all the support tasks to be done, little shed there to keep the paint in, etc. So much more um, efficient building in which to operate these businesses. And we can see a sort of proto-factory here using hand printing techniques um, but th this is what was being established in, in these larger buildings. Success was so great for some that within a few years they'd even outgrown these spaces. And by the early 19th century, one of the leading firms, Harwood & Co., who'd taken over Shrewsbury House in Chelsea, moved again to bigger purpose-built premises in Adam Street West. So you can see how much more useful that building would be for for the printing of wallpaper and, the, and uh, its manufacture. Investment in these businesses amounted to thousands. John Edison, for example, invested £20,000 in the Whiteland's business in 1814. Production was concerned with appealing to as wide a customer base as possible by providing a range of wallpapers at different prices, ranging from around two and a half pence to, to several shillings per yard in order to justify the cost and outlay. There was a, uh, at the higher end, at several shillings a yard, there was a prestige range of expensive papers, a kind of simply the best, um, select, uh, taste the difference range, if you will, but the bulk of the production was uh, concentrated on the manufacture of their mainstream, more affordable wallpapers termed common papers, for the much larger consumer group of the middle classes. This was easily achieved through the block printing process. In this, a background colour was first brushed over the length of the paper and the successive elements of the design were built up using a ser series of the carved wooden blocks, each block representing a different colour. The larger or more complex the design, the more blocks were required to be carved and therefore the more expensive the paper. So I'll just show you. So you can see that apart from the first one, any one of those could have been offered. If you hadn't seen that one, you, you might be prepared to buy any of the preceding four perhaps um, as a, a simple or a more complex design. That one's got gold on as well, so obviously that would be at the higher end of the process. But the blocks have been carved for two different um, runs of wallpaper, two different types, common papers and expensive ones. In an effort to expand the market as far as possible, notwithstanding the bottom line price imposed by the wallpaper tax, ways were therefore sought to make labour and equipment more cost effective and efficient. With the carving of the block as the more skilled, time-consuming, costly element of the process, designs that could combine the cheaper process of stenciling with block printing were produced. So here's an example. Um, the, blue, the blue background colour and the black background colour are stenciled on, 
Um, the only thing requiring a block print is the white um, defining flower and trellis work, which is which is block printed over that and not very accurately, you slightly mismatched there. Reducing the repeat of the wallpaper pattern to fit one block rather than requiring several different ones to create a, a, a large scale design like we, like we saw in the first slide um, also saved costs and these small motif designs became ubiquitous in printed furnishing and fashion textiles as well as wallpapers during this period. Details on these patterns could also be printed by metal shapes inserted into the block as opposed to being carved in wood, and thus saved carver craftsman costs, whilst also making the blocks last longer. These pins and small devices could be hammered in place by children, further cutting labour costs. This was also a practice in the, in the calico printing trade as well. So you can see here the, I hope you can see here the black dots in the background, giving it a sort of te uh, a, a more two, a three-dimensional look to that, giving it a bit of background detail, um, but that was actually produced very simply by nailing um, brass pins into the wooden block and not requiring the carving skills. These dot prints added an extra three-dimensional quality to the printed surface by suggesting background depth, as I've just said, and became extremely popular. By the end of the 18th century, simple pinprint roller machines were also in use, which allowed for even more efficient and cheaper production of background details. I've put the scale in there so you can see actually ha how small these were. So that could be uh, uh, that that was a, a that could be a, a roller print um, pin dot pattern or or a block either one, but the, the repeat was very small, thus not necessitating much carving or indeed pinning of, of block work. Ingenious adaptation of the stock of block prints allowed manufacturers to produce up-to-date, fashionable wallpapers which required only a few blocks to print. In this case, this fashionable lace pattern in French grey was produced from only one block first printed in black and then again in white, slightly offset to, to, to create a three-dimensional effect. Similarly, in this example, the same block has been used, just turned on its side and printed in a different colour to economically produce this rustic textured weave effect, which was particularly popular at the time. All of these wallpapers were available at a range of prices depending on the degree of embellishment and the quality of the paints and other materials used, thus maximising the cost effectiveness of the manufacturer's stock of blocks, because obviously you could use more expensive paint, a different colour that was uh, more expensive, or cheaper earth pigments, uh, cheaper versions of French grey, which was very expensive, which was just basically carbon black and chalk white mixed together to produce grey. Um, so there were ways of offering the same thing, but a, a cheaper version. Um, popular selling lines were tweaked and modified slightly each year to offer a new pattern for the next season, but with minimal outlay. The rigid tax laws necessitated standardisation of paper sizes and as such, this meant that printing blocks were often interchangeable between designs, as of course was the bankrupt stock of another man's business. Patterns built up of stripes, dots and dashes and small motifs were fashionable as they suggested discreet restraint, but for the manufacturer, this enabled them to interchange their stock in trade without necessarily having to carve a whole new set of blocks. Here's a further example. So this isn't just one uh, one block uh, with a dip carved with a daisy pattern. As you can see, because there are two colours making up the flower. So the dot is a separate block and the flower is a separate block. Um, and they could then be used um, with, in conjunction with other blocks in different patterns, um, thus uh, uh, it, um, making um, many permutations of one design um, to be used with other in combination with other patterns. So business success in conquering the middle class market lay therefore in the production of a quick turnover of high volume sales with low profit margins. 
distributed from the London manufactories all across Britain. Reputations were established by the leading London manufacturers via their high-end ranges of wallpapers supplied to the gentry and upper classes. Several of the leading manufacturers had merged or taken over wallpaper firms that had enjoyed a prestigious reputation among the elite alongside other London luxury goods trades in the 1750s, a fact that they were keen to promote. Alongside their manufactories on the outskirts, each had a prestigious shop or wholesale offices in the fashionable shopping streets of the West End and, and uh, the City of London, which we would now recognise as a flagship store. This is the Strand, and Richard Macefield's shop is just visible at the very, very end, a bit blurred, um, and slightly later than when he had it, but um, he, the, his business was carried on by um, a, a, work, a business colleague of his. So. Um, and this one is of Cheapside, where a lot of wallpaper manufacturers had their shops and their offices, including James Woodmason, who was an extremely wealthy stationer, who bought into a wallpaper concern as a, as a little bit of a sideline, um, which had a manufactory in Chelsea, and he sold it a few years later for a considerable amount of money. So riding on this reputation and, and practicing product differentiation, they were able to secure recognition and sales for their more extensive, cheaper ranges across a vast network of retail and wholesale contacts. Riders or travellers and commission agents were also employed to take examples of their patterns to newly expanding urban areas at home and to a network of export contacts in Europe, America and the colonies. By the 1830s, well over 50% of the market share in wallpaper was in the hands of less than 10 market leaders. So you can see at the top there, Williams, uh, Cooper and Co. They were also wholesale stationers um, and wallpaper manufacturers in Smithfield. Um, and uh, in 1832, for example, they had an output of over 65,000 rolls of wallpaper. Lacking the advantages of economies of scale and large capital investment, it became increasingly more difficult for small tradesmen and new startups to compete at this level with the major wholesalers who had consolidated their position, wealth and reputations from the middle of the 18th century onwards. The latter now formed an oligarchy of wallpaper manufacturers that would brook no competition. Discounts for bulk sales were offered by their extensive network of re retail contacts to customers hungry to possess London manufactured wallpapers. Lost leaders were offered for sale to eager consumers by the market leaders who were sufficiently rich to withstand a temporary hit or two. Potential losses incurred on unsuccessful designs and, and last year's patterns on which the manufacturers had already paid the excise tax could be more readily recouped through cut price sales and line ends sold by this extensive network of London and regional shopkeepers, wholesale mer merchants and auctioneers. In addition, any unsuccessful designs unpopular in the home market could be sold off cheaply through merchant contacts to markets abroad. Again, this facility was only available to those wholesale manufacturers with bulk quantities to sell as the export tax that they were due to pay was not worth paying if one only had a small consignment of papers to sell. This dominance of the market by large firms conforms to the model suggested by Leonard Schwartz for the development of many trades over the course of this period. Yet while Schwartz argues that this situation made it more difficult for smaller tradesmen to operate, for the wallpaper trade, this situation was slightly more complex and it did allow for some smaller firms to challenge the oligopoly of the main market leaders. The reprographic nature of wallpaper printing made it possible for unskilled traders to set up in business producing wallpapers once they had, already, once they had acquired 
already carved printing blocks as the means of production. It was possible to get hold of pre-carved blocks second-hand, as we've seen through bankruptcy and closing down sales, but also to buy blocks from woodworking craftsmen who would carve them for you. From the early 1800s onwards, the number of small traders producing simple wallpapers therefore increased. As purchasing power rose over the period, it became possible for more consumers to acquire wallpapers either through the competitive pricing policies of the market leaders or via the output of these semi-skilled producers. There were other challenges to the dominance of the large wholesale London manufacturers as well. During the course of the 18th century, other luxury and semi-luxury goods, such as ceramics and textile manufacture, had gradually moved out of London to settle in areas such as Staffordshire and Lancashire, where setup costs, labour and overheads were lower than that in the capital. The wallpaper trade had chosen to remain in London, not least because they had built their reputation across Britain as the first houses in London, a location identified with fashion and quality wallpaper production. But by the early 19th century, their regional market was being challenged by firms who could make wallpapers cheaper elsewhere. Responding to the demand created by the metropolitan firms, manufacturers were established in regional centres that had growing populations and had existing transport networks to other towns and the hinterlands that they served. So, slightly more naive trade card than the Richard Macefield one, but nonetheless, this manufacturer was extremely successful regionally and, uh, and indeed had a shop in London at one point. Places as far away as the Isle of Man saw the establishment of regional wallpaper manufacturers. For example, Robert Fell, painter and decorator in the shambles in the island's capital of Douglas, set up his own Manx manufactory in 1802 and placed an advertisement in the local press stating that he had bought the utensils necessary for carrying on a manufactory of printed paper hangings in the island, for the execution of which he has with him a man of distinguished abilities and long experience in such manufactory, by whose assistance he will be able in future to serve the public well. Fell had brought in the services of an experienced paper stainer. Like other regional manufacturers, these were often journeymen who had worked in the London trade, an asset that regional firms chose to stress in their advertisements. So, having created a fashionable market for simple designs, it became easy for others to imitate these patterns. Only a crudely cut block or two being required. Helped by a fall in the price of paper during the early 19th century, small traders could produce their own basic designs. By the early 19th century, there were real concerns that even the building sector were producing their own crude designs from a few second-hand blocks to use as marketing incentives in their properties. And this was particularly going to the main leading manufacturers because um, they, they made wallpaper specifically advertised for builders um, to, to sell in their properties. So when they started doing it themselves, they weren't very pleased. As wallpaper decoration of varying quality became increasingly familiar across more levels of society, so emerged a large black market in illegally printed, non-taxed wallpapers. Old Bailey documents record thefts of printing blocks and wallpapers which extended the market to the less genteel consumer who was happy to buy their luxury goods as knockoff from a man down the pub. In fact, there's an account of um, the, uh, the workman in the, uh, in the uh, Shrewsbury House in Chelsea manufactory, a anecdotal, um, that uh, they were, there was actually a tunnel there where they used to hide wallpapers um, and then secrete them out at night, uh, which they would then flog to people mm -hmm. in public houses, etc., etc. So the workers were actually stealing the, stealing the stock as well to make a buck themselves. Others deliberately avoided paying the wallpaper tax, often by forging tax stamps, in some cases in collusion with dishonest excise officers. 
By the 1830s, the scale of tax evasion was regarded as a significant cause for concern, particularly as it was so easy to achieve. Nathaniel Hinchcliffe of the Whitelands Manufactory in Chelsea, reporting to a Royal Commission of Inquiry into Excise in 1834, described one method thus. The paper stainer's process is so quick that he can do enough to paper a room and will take this to a gentleman's house before he's up in the morning and cut off the tops and bottoms where the frame mark, that's the stamp, should be and prepare for the papering of the room. And the gentleman can never find out if the tops and bottoms are cut off and thrown into the fire. At the same inquiry, Mr W Hetherington, Surveyor General Examiner of the Board of Excise, stated that in some cases this also, uh, tax evasion also occurred through the manufacturer's lack of understanding of the complexity of the procedure he was obliged to follow and his attendant responsibilities. Indeed, Hetherington himself admitted that at first he'd struggled to understand these regulations and he doubted whether his colleagues did either. Much of the activity was on this small scale and was rarely detected. Only a few large-scale frauds were brought to justice, such as the high-profile case of Morris Martin, a wallpaper manufacturer of Regent Street. Regent Street. Martin was found guilty of owing the excise £39,000 in penalties following a tax stamp forging enterprise that Mr Carr, solicitor for the excise, described as one of the deepest laid schemes ever to defraud the Crown. Of importance to the legitimate manufacturers, of course, some of whom, fa some of whom found it necessary to advertise that they were licensed manufacturers, was the fact that their wallpapers could be seriously undercut on price at the lower end of the market by, in effect, tax-free wallpapers, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for the larger capitalist and legitimate manufacturers to compete with this level of small producer black marketeering. Not only were the leading manufacturers being challenged at, a lo at the lower end of the market, but their prestigious range also faced competition from abroad, in particular from France. Here, wages for skilled labour were lower than in London, as were costs for materials. It became possible, therefore, for French wallpaper manufacturers to offer high quality wallpapers at a much lower cost than the English home market. So you can see here, this is an example of the um, kind of wallpapers that the French were producing at this time. The vibrant colours and pictorial imagery used on French wallpapers contrasted starkly with the English trade's obsession with simpler patterns and plainer neoclassical pared down designs in drab, muted shades of stone, grey and beige that were also easier and cheaper to produce. The fashion for French styles gathered momentum towards the end of the 18th century onwards and there were genuine concerns after the end of, of uh, the wars with France in 1815 that trade tariffs would be lowered to such an extent that French imports would threaten their high status ranges as well. So, just wrapping up now, by the, by the 1830s, many trades, including that of textiles and furniture, as well as wallpaper, were experiencing a decline in design standards that was recognised, and some responsibility must be accorded to the English wallpaper manufacturers for their deliberate cultivation of the popular market in cheaper papers. Whilst working within the tax requirements in extending their markets, both socially and geographically, <coughs> they had popularised wallpapers in simple patterns. The demand for these was such that wallpapers became easily and cheaply copied by regional manufacturers, the unskilled using blocks carved by others, and those misusing the tax regulations. In the face of these complex in, in the face of these complex intersections of supply and demand, the market leaders were forced to admit that the wallpaper tax, which had previously helped restrict entry into the trade, was no longer viable for them. The tax, which had required wallpaper to be produced in separate individual lengths of 12 yards, was abolished in 1836, paving the way 
for the machine printing of continuous rolls of wallpaper. However, it was not until several decades later that the wallpaper trade in England managed to um, recover its previous reputation that it, it, that it had had during the second half and early uh, second half of the 18th century and early 19th century.